Hello, my name is Rachel Kormala, Numerity's Digital Marketing Manager. Welcome to our monthly webinar entitled The True Cost of Cloud by Numerity's Research CEO, Jana Till Johnson. This webinar consists of an interactive presentation and moderated Q&A period. To submit a question, please use the control panel on GoToWebinar. If you experience any technical difficulties, please contact webinars at numerities.com. Upon conclusion of the webinar, you will receive a you will be presented with a short survey. Please answer the questions to provide feedback on this webinar and content for future webinars. We also ask if you would like to participate in our research. In exchange for participation, you will receive access to our research. Let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to turn this over now to Jana Till Johnson. Great. Thank you so much, Rachel, and welcome, to, uh, welcome everybody. This is a great presentation. I am very delighted to, to share these, uh, this res these results with you. So we've got a lot here, so let's go ahead and get started. So here's what we're going to cover. I'll give you a little bit of information about Nemertes, mostly so you understand where the bar charts and pie charts come from. Then we'll walk through moving to cloud, uh, the fact that it's not as easy as it looks. Um, we're actually going to do the agenda at the beginning rather than uh, after the about Nemertes. Uh, then we'll walk through the basic components of the cost model, uh, looking at computing, storage, and networking, and then look at some true cost of cloud components that are often forgotten about, like staffing and adjacencies, and we're going to call out the special case of software as a service. We'll then boil all of this up into a set of recommendations for you and tell you how to get more information. Looks pretty good. And then we'll give you good information about the next webinar and move right away to some Q&A. And just to repeat what Rachel said, uh, you are able to answer questions on the panel. I sometimes check the panel even while I'm presenting, so I'll try to answer your questions during the course of the presentation. But if I don't, we'll be taking Q&A at the end. Okay, about Nemertes. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with us, we are a global IT research and strategic consulting firm that focuses on the business impact of emerging technology. I'm not going to bore you by reading all of the bullet items here. I will highlight that the research that we're going to be presenting comes from our hot off the presses, 2017-2018 um, Cloud Networking and Security Benchmark and Maturity Model for which we surveyed and interviewed 625 organizations in 12 countries uh, across a range of vertical industries including for-profit, not-for-profit, state and local government, large enterprise organizations, and so forth and so on. So this is a very comprehensive study. Uh, we, will, we will be rolling out a lot of research from the study as we move forward. It's also based on work we've done with our clients as we help them navigate the cloud transition. So speaking of the cloud transition, it's not quite as easy as it looks. And I suspect that many of you are here because you know that and you're, you'd like to find out what some of the pitfalls and gotchas are. So let's get started. The first is uh, the general perception among senior management that going to cloud saves money. I mean, when you think about it, you can, you can run these workloads for pennies on the dollar at Amazon or, you know, one of the common cloud platforms. So, gosh, cloud must be cheaper, right? Well, not quite. Uh, what we found is that, that agility is actually the best reason to move to cloud, and we'll talk about how that translates into real operational metrics as we go through. Uh, but in some cases, you're not really saving money. You're actually just moving it around. And it's important to understand that as you're forming budgets, structuring organizations, and purchasing tools, because if the expectation is something that used to be expensive just got free, the chances are that expectation is false. Well, is moving to the cloud as easy as it looks? Sometimes it is. It actually is pretty easy on a workload by workload basis. If you're moving like for like workloads, you're very familiar with the VMs that comprise your workloads, you know exactly what you're doing. Uh, and you know what your expected demand, you know your capacity, and you know how this workload behaves, then as a matter of fact, moving to cloud could not be easier. Um, once you start looking across vendors and at larger portfolios of workloads and VMs, though, cloud can get very complex quickly, and we'll show you how. So let's start with the basic components. Start with computing. Uh, one thing I want to highlight, we've got the who across the top, which is the you know top cloud providers, you may ask us, why did you pick Amazon, Microsoft, Google, IBM, and Oracle, and not XYZ provider? The answer is, in that study that we conducted, these are the ones that had enough participants that we could actually capture good, solid data for benchmarking and other purposes. So one clear 
clear takeaway from this is it's no longer a one horse or two horse game. You don't want to look at cloud and say to yourself, cloud is necessarily just Amazon or just Microsoft Azure. Those may be the best options for you. They may not. Um, but you do want to consider the other players because your peers are as well. And the other players are Google, IBM, and Oracle. Um, if you look at the core of the pricing, now let's get to the, you know, cut to the chase here. Uh, Amazon has 57 different kinds of virtual machines. Microsoft has 48. Google has 21 plus the custom configs. IBM has a, a portfolio of custom configs and Oracle has 15 shapes, which is its term for VM. So comparing like for like already got hard and we're just at the first line item of the comparison. Then there's the billing granularity. Um, so Amazon will bill by the hour. So if you just use one minute of compute resources, you still get billed for the 59 minutes you didn't use. Microsoft will bill by the minute. Google will bill by the minute after the first 10. So if you use one minute, you're billed for 10. But if you use 11 minutes, you're billed for 11. And IBM and Oracle also have the Amazon style of, of billing granularity. That is, of course, if you haven't nego negotiated something separate with them, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, also, instances can be distinguished by performance. So CPU memory architectures and configurations uh, can be different. Um, the, event, the providers will also group them by performance requirement patterns. So they might sell you high memory or high compute or low storage or massive input output types of workloads. Uh, and most importantly, the availability of a specific instance type can vary by region. What do we mean by region? Well, for example, you might go to, to uh, Amazon and want one of their high performance computing types and discover that's actually not available in US East or, or it's only available in US East or US West. It's not available in US Central. And by the way, I'm not saying that's the case. I'm giving that as an example. Um, over time, availability is going to become more ubiquitous, but right now you may, you, you may need to be able to be making a trade off between the region in which you're operating and what you're getting. Um, and the reason that matters, of course, is region has to do with latency, latency has to do with performance. So these are all things you need to think, of, think about when you're actually putting together your, your cost model. And oh, by the way, each of the individual vendors has their own special little twists. So Amazon, for example, actually sells you three flavors of services. There's basic, which is what we talked about on the previous slide. And then there are reserves instances, which means you actually reserve the commitment to run your workloads at specified times. The great thing about that is you can get phenomenal discounting depending on the commitment, very deep discounts for greater commitments. If you do a committed spend, though, you pay for it no matter whether you use it or on what infrastructure you're using it. You can do some conversion. It's kind of, you know, rent to own or convert owning back to renting. That gives you, that lowers your discount, but that gives you more flexibility. Um, and then the greatest flexibility is in spot instances, which is really how they, uh, you know, how they do their, you know, capacity pricing. They can excess auction off excess capacity. You can bid at a price point and decide that you actually want to execute your workloads when costs drop to that point. You can either use them until the cost goes back up and you don't want to pay that much, or you finish and you don't pay for that last fractional hour. You can get phenomenal discounts if you use spot instances, but you really need to be doing workloads that can be interruptible and not super time sensitive. Um, this is actually really in interesting as a model to me because way back when I was a young engineer, I think it was Sun uh, Microsystems, had a researcher there had come up with an auction-based workload uh, workload distribution mechanism, which ended up working out pretty well. So I'm not at all surprised that Amazon went ahead and implemented it. Microsoft has its own set of twists. The big one is the they reward their most loyal customers the most is probably the best way to put this. If you have an if you have if you are not an an enterprise customer, you have the basic rates, and you'll see the basic rates on upcoming slides. If you are an enterprise customer, you can negotiate enterprise discounting and you can get multi-year commitments, you can get massively steep percentage discounts and they can be applied broadly, not just for specific workloads. Um, you can also get standard versus basic, uh, it's very similar to the way Amazon does the same thing. Uh, in that case, you know, the basic is you have fewer types, lower CPU and lower input output, no high memory, no auto scale and bring your own load balancing. Um, you can also get low priority batch, again, similar to Amazon, but slightly different. Uh, short term allocations of excess capacity. Unlike with Spot, there's no, there's no uh, Amazon Spot, there's actually no bargaining here. And these low priority loads can be dump, bumped by regular nodes without warning, again, like Spot. 
And you can also pile on another set of discounts if you bring your own Windows licenses to get additional discounts above and beyond your enterprise agreement discounting. So essentially, Microsoft, uh, Microsoft makes it a better and better deal the, the more you use Microsoft services, which is predictable from them and quite a good strategy for them. Uh, then if you look at some of the other players, Google has sustained use discounts. The more you use it, the less they charge you for each particular minute. These are applied retroactively, so your costs go down in retrospect. Uh, they're also working for the committed instance, which is very much like the Amazon, Reserve, Amazon Web Services reserved instance. Uh, then there's the Oracle Compute Service, which has unmetered options as well as standard metered options. They also can get you off the, the standard x86 platforms, and you can be using Spark, for example. IBM, their rates for bare metal are the same as virtual, and they also, like Oracle, have non-x86 available. So there's lots of other twists. The big takeaway is if you're just looking to answer the question, what does it cost to run a virtual machine, there's no simple answer just to start with, and we haven't even begun to, to get to the roots of the cost model that we put together. Um, what about if you want to use graphics processors to train your AI or you process your big data? Well, that's, gonna, that's going to increase the complexity of figuring out what it's going to cost you. What about if you need a committed lev level of I.O. operations per second, IOPS, for your transaction processing system? Because you are now in the second phase of your cloud migration, and you're moving core applications out to the cloud. What if you want to use a fully programmable gate, gate array in your deep learning initiative or ultra-high speed InfiniBand for your storage or network traffic, which we'll talk about shortly? These are all options you can get. They may be the right options for the applications you're deploying, but they also increase the, the price. So keep in mind that there are so many variables to twist that it's almost impossible to create. Uh, you know, the, well, you could create a matrix that would get like for like, but it would be multi-dimensional hyperspace matrix, and it would be very, very difficult to actually compute. Now, we talked about that was just computing. But as we all know, in order to run a workload, you need more than just computing. You need storage. Um, most of the providers will sell you block storage by default. Sometimes they'll include system disk storage with compute allocation. That would be Microsoft and Google do this. Sometimes they don't. Amazon doesn't. Uh, you may have object storage options, file system as a service options, and hardware can be dependent on, it, 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 actually, sorry, your hardware, your storage is hardware and therefore region and data center dependent. I was skipping ahead to the next bullet item. You can actually get hard drive or solid state drive depending on what you're looking for. And the key thing is, regardless of the bits that you set on the type of storage, you can pay by the, you pay by the gigabyte of space that you're actually consuming. It's just that your gigabyte of space has multiple bits that can set it, so it's different flavors of space. So that's something else you need to consider. And then there's the network. There's actually two areas of the network that you need to look at. One is intra and intercloud, which is really uh, how your workloads communicate when they are on the same cloud provider, regardless of the physical location where they are. Um, so there's typically no added cost for things that are near each other to talk if they're on the same um, cloud platform. Typically, though not always, there's no additional cost on the cloud side for inbound traffic, but where it comes and bites you, and I won't say where it bites you, but you all know, is for data going out. And that depends quite a lot on where it's going out from and where it's going out to. And these costs can be, as you can see, variable and non-trivial. Non so you're paying per gigabyte of data transmitted. Yes, that's correctly gigabyte as opposed to bit per second because they use, you know, they're looking at the volume, not the speed. And the rates are tiered by volume, usually at terabyte granularity. Um, and these costs can add up very, very quickly, particularly for certain types of workloads, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, then there's the WAN side. How do you get your users to the cloud applications? Obviously, if you're building an application that's for third parties, you know, consumers, outsiders, that the WAN is not your problem. How they connect to the cloud is not your problem. If it's for your own internal users, then in fact it is your problem, and you're going to need to think about re-architecting your WAN to take advantage of the traffic flows that are now no longer going back across your private WAN to your private data center, but are actually likely going out across big internet to the cloud, or possibly across a custom infrastructure that you've put in place to go to the cloud. And oh, by the way, that custom infrastructure costs money. Um, the custom infrastructure can include things like direct cloud 
Connections DCC, that's direct WAN to WAN link um, to your cloud provider of choice. WAN cloud, cloud exchanges, you know, the Equinixes of the world, you go through a dedicated non-public exchange instead of direct. You can also go SD-WAN from your branches out to the cloud with the SD-WAN providing the routing capability uh, from the branches out to the cloud. All of these services are available from a range of providers. The providers are typically partnering with the cloud providers. What we've seen in the past 12 months, 12 to 18 months, is that the telco guys and the cloud guys have finally decided that each one should stick to their knitting. So they've decided to partner rather than, say, Amazon and Google trying to build out the full network. They're going to partner with the AT&Ts and the Verizons and the you know BTs and the Vodafones of the world to get connected. Um, but nonetheless, you have to factor in that additional infrastructure cost. And by the way, when it comes to what most people forget, this is a very big one. This whole WAN infrastructure piece is a piece that people often forget. So I've thrown a whole bunch of variables at you. Hopefully you're now convinced it's not quite as simple as it looks. How do you put this all together and do some analysis and try to decide you know, what cloud option makes sense for you? Before I jump into this, you've heard me refer to the cloud cost model a couple of times. Uh, what we typically do here at Numerities is create a, a model or a series of related models. In this case, we have a series of related models that capture real data, you know, paid costs by end users, as well as um, traditional, you know, stated rates from providers. And, and you'll see a couple of stated rates when it comes to staffing. Pull them together so that we can actually do what if scenarios. So the key thing here is this isn't a model in the scientific sense of let's predict you know, the future. It's more a model in the sense of let's take real data and do what if use case kinds of scenarios. So what if I make the decision to build a workload using different VMs or using different characteristics? And again, we've got a series of interlinked models that allow you to, to combine all of the components that we've talked about and get a real sense of the true cost of cloud. So this is really what we're showing you here is just the tip of the iceberg. When we work with clients, we work through the whole iceberg and, and really help to uncover any of the things that are going to surprise you. So the first step is to find some typical virtual machine types. Um, you know, we've creatively named them type one, two, and three. Uh, type one uh, would have one virtual CPU, uh, two gigabytes of memory, and might be for something simple like a web front end. Type 2 would, would have twice the processing capability, twice the, um, you know, twice the memory, and might be applicable for, say, application code. Um, type 3 might have twice, again, the, the processing and four times the memory because you're doing heavy calculations, you're you know, grid computing, you're doing back-end database, who knows what you're doing with that. You've defined these as type 1, type 2, and type 3. So now you have three types of work of uh, VMs that you're going to build your workload from. Now what you do is build a workload, creatively named type A, B, C, and D. That's a combination of those VMs. So maybe type A is, you know, two from column A, two from column B, and none from column, uh, two from column one, two from column two, and none from column three, as you can see. So A would be, would have these characteristics of being, uh, you know, Two of the first two, so that would include, let's see, front-end applications and then the application, but no heavy-duty grid computing. Um, type C might be much more heavy-duty with the grid computing with only some lightweight front-end applications. At any rate, you're building those out. The next thing you do is associate storage with those workloads. So how much storage are you going to need? Oh, by the way, remember storage comes in multiple flavors. We're going to decide that everybody needs a certain amount of block storage, but only type D needs object storage, because remember we talked about that as potentially being databases. Um, so associate your storage with that. And remember, output that cost of I.O., how much are you going to, how much, what is the volume of data you're going to be putting out per hour, because that's going to affect your price as well. So type A might be, you know, one big gigabyte per hour, type C might be 100 gigabytes per hour. Keep in mind, again, type, types A through D are the workload types built from the VMs, which are types one through three. Now you're thinking, well, what if I have more types of workloads and more types of VMs? Well, it gets just that much more complex, doesn't it now? Now you blend that into your complete mix. So maybe you've got a total of 80 workloads split 
10% are type A, 10% are type B, 10% are type C, because we wanted to make this easy, and 70% are type D, and conveniently enough, 70 plus 10 plus 10 plus 10 equals 100%. Um, now you can see what you've got, uh, what you've actually got. You decompose it back into its core components, so that would, that would decompose back into 16 type 1 VMs for workload type A, 16 type for workload type B, 16 for workload type C, et cetera, et cetera. So 112 type 1s, 504 type 2s, 112 type 3s. Um, you know, similarly, if you look at the storage, you're decoupling it and you, find, and you get your data input and output. So here you've got maybe, as I said, a simple web app, e-commerce, a complex web app, high performance computing grid. You've decomposed it into things you can now price out. Oh, what about that little box on the corner? What are the uh, what's the cost of the tools that you're using to migrate those workloads per year? Uh, we can go into that. That's actually above and beyond the scope of what we're talking about here. But you've got to think in terms of migration tools, integration tools, and management tools that you have to have for each of these workloads. And as you can see, the, the cost is actually not super huge for that, but it's certainly worth building into this. And what do you see? Who's cheaper? Who's the best, cheapest? Uh, who's the best, cheapest cloud provider out there? Well, that kind of depends. <laughs> um, what workloads do you have and um, how many of them do you have? As you can see, oh, and by the way, what discounts are you going to get access to? So as you can see, if you go line by line, gosh, Amazon wins on type A, but actually comes in slightly more expensive than, uh, than other folks on types B, C, and D. Google comes out ahead on B, C, and D across the board. Microsoft, IBM, and Oracle are looking mighty pricey compared to some of their competitors until you remember this is undiscounted and they have extremely creative discount structures that you can negotiate, particularly as a large enterprise. So the important thing is to understand is not so much that there's a winner or loser here when it comes to price as the price actually depends on what you're trying to do and it also depends to a very large extent on your entity to entity relationship. It's actually no surprise here that the last three, IBM, Microsoft, and Oracle, are much more creative with enterprise licensing than Amazon and Google, only because they have decades more experience dealing with enterprises and they understand how to, you know, how to do the discount engineering so that they can make the numbers come out to the point where you want to be their customer. And that's important to recognize as well, because most of us, and I will admit, uh, that until we did this latest round of research, I was pretty willing to dismiss the cloud universe as a two-horse race, but IBM, Microsoft, and Oracle are quickly gaining steam, and you really want to consider them if any of those are your strategic partners, in addition to the Amazons and Googles of the world. Um, uh, a, couple of, uh, a couple of other points before I leave this. Uh, we've also captured some great data on how happy people are with these different providers. And that data will be presented on, on an upcoming webinar a month from now, so stay tuned for that. Uh, it's going to be some very interesting findings because um, there are some significant variations in what we call the sentiment analysis, so stay tuned for that. All right, well, here we are almost half an hour into this, uh, into this presentation, and we still have a couple of components to go. One of them is staffing. One of the things we found in our most recent study is that cloud architect, the role of cloud architect is something new and growing. Um, typically, if anyone has a cloud architect, they have more than eight of them, um, and they're typically planning to add more. Um, this is because architecting for cloud, for those of you who are listening going, yeah, I'm a cloud architect and this is not easy stuff, you're vindicated here. Now, what's interesting is if you look at the pie chart uh, of the benchmark, benchmark study, we, we found that 18% have a cloud architect today, but another 15% are planning by the end of the year. We actually, actually asked the question that way on purpose because we conduct the research over a, a window of about two to three months, and we want to sort of rationalize that. You know, If we ask somebody in January whether they have something and they're planning to have something by the end of March, we want to make sure we include that. So really, the number you want to look at is that um, 33% of have now plus planning for 2017. Another good 12% are planning for 2018, and the uh, another 15% are evaluating the option of having a cloud architect. So that 30%, 37% in that sort of pale Irish green, 
those are folks that haven't even begun to think about it yet. And that's a surprising almost 40%. And only 3% have evaluated but rejected the role of cloud architects. Uh, what about solution architects? Well, these are folks that put together the right sourcing pieces for a solution, including the stuff that's getting developed in-house. So they're a layer down in granularity from the cloud architects. Um, they're often staff that's been displaced by automation elsewhere in the organization. They, they tend to be your extremely bright sysadmins who have grown to do lots of other things or possibly storage admins. Uh, once again, we have about 40% of companies haven't even thought about having one. 12% have, uh, another 11% have, are planning for 2017, so that's about 23% uh, that's about 23 that essentially have this year with another 12% planning for 2018, um, and a few more, you know, almost 20% are evaluating. It's a role you really want to think about in your organization as well as the cloud architect. And then my personal favorite, security. Um, we asked this question a couple of different ways in our, uh, in our study. And we found that most folks are not really putting the right degree of urgency into cloud security that, in our humble opinion, they should be. Um, again, you see the statistics are fairly similar. You know, again, almost 40% don't have cloud security specialists compared to, you know, roughly 22% uh, that do or will by the end of 2018, uh, 2017. Um, but we would strongly urge you, if it's at all possible, to get your security team involved in the cloud initiative sooner rather than later. Uh, because this is going to be a, an extremely important area over the next several years. If you can't do cloud securely, you can't do cloud at all, full stop. And since you can't really afford to not do cloud, you must do cloud securely. But we're not done yet. What about vendor relationship management? Uh, this is AKA the good, the good folks in procurement. Um, interestingly enough here, the median is about two um, most are, most of the folks that do not have a cloud specialist in procurement treat cloud providers and contracts the same as any other IT purchase. And I have to highlight something. My colleague, John Burke, who prepared these slides and is, in fact, a subject matter expert here, um, but couldn't be here to present today, um, puts in parentheses for good or ill. That's because he's Midwestern and really nice. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm a New Yorker, and I'll be a little bit more pugnacious. That's a terrible idea. Cloud is not like any other IT purchase because it's ongoing. Um, you really need someone who understands what's going on in cloud to ensure that you've got all the, all the capabilities, all the flexibility, and all the security that you need. But as you can see, that's an area where folks lag behind the most. In fact, fully 50% don't even have any plans because they haven't started to think about it. So you have to factor the cost of these humans into your, your cost model as well. So uh, I, I want to be clear that we did not capture this data from the 625 organizations that we benchmarked, simply because they range across 12 countries. There's too much variability in this data. It, you can plug in your own data in our, in our tool and really work through this. So if you're you know, East Coast or West Coast and these numbers look laughably low to you, you can get the right numbers in there. You know, if you're in a region where they look ridiculously high, you can plug in your own. But essentially, you need to think in terms of the number of people you have as a cloud architect, a solution architect, a cloud security specialist, and oh, a cloud integration specialist. You start adding all this up, and you're starting to get into the millions, and that's not even loaded. Um, you know, you can add in the loading factor as well, which we've gotten in the model. So depending on how large you are, how sophisticated you are, and how complex you are, you're spending almost $2 million before you even got off the ground with any cloud services. Now, obviously, you're not going to staff up and then deploy your first virtual machine to the cloud, but you get the idea. So you have to think about this. And this is where folks who have a fair amount of experience in outsourcing have been waiting for the other shoe to drop. They expect this. Um, this is highly predictable based on uh, how outsourcing works, and cloud is a form of outsourcing. You really require people to manage it much more than you ever think you do when you're first, first assessing it. And certainly when you're doing prototypes, it's not nearly as big a challenge. What about adjacent costs? Well, there's a whole slew of adjacencies. Um, if you're managing a multi-cloud environment, you're going to be wanting to pay cloud service brokers. Uh, these guys can help you with the, depending on whether you get the human kind or the automated kind, they can help you with this kind of pricing comparison, but also cost you. They can also do automated workload distribution based on metrics if they're the automated kind. Uh, if based on metrics, 
that you set and policies that you set, but again, they can cost thousands to millions of dollars on their own depending on how you set things up. If you're doing security, you may want to use Cloud Access Security Brokers, CASB, to monitor and control access, to notice something like, hey, Jonna, you're doing something on Amazon Web Services that you shouldn't be doing. We've only authorized that particular workload to run on IBM, so please go use the you know, agreed upon solution over here at IBM. Um, but again, that adds to your cost. Also, resilience and disaster recovery. Uh, most workloads are not designed for the cloud around resilient microservices, distributed databases, and stateless operations, so you still need to figure out how you're doing backup. Um, one very large financial services firm asked us a fun question recently, which was, hey, everybody talks about the benefits of cloud as being this flexibility, and you can move workloads from A to B without having to worry, and that should give you great resilience. Is anyone actually doing that? And it was a great question because we kind of said, um, not that I'm aware of. I actually was there. I said, I'm not that I'm aware of, but I'm going to go ask my subject matter experts. They came back and said, not that we're aware of. Nobody's doing it today, but we all know that's where it's headed. So eventually, cloud, having a multi-cloud platform is going to give you optimized resilience and disaster recovery. But for today, you have to plan, plan around that. Um, and gee, then you also have to think about where to automate, how much to automate, where you're ready to automate, and where you haven't worked through the processes yet to automate. So as I mentioned, you know, cloud security brokers can be automated software, cloud management pro platforms like VMware vRealize. These can all make cloud really happen, but they're not free even if they're open source because you have to support them. And these are adjacencies that you have to factor in, along with, as we've talked about, the network infrastructure that you've got to build out. All of those are things that we can help you model. We've just focused on the core, what does it actually cost? Last but not least, we want to do a quick shout out on SaaS, the other side of the cloud. Um, SaaS provides agility and it lets IT focus elsewhere, uh, but it tends not to be cheaper except for smaller organizations. Um, you'll, clever and observant folks will immediately notice this is a particular type of SaaS. We're not modeling Salesforce here, we're actually looking at UCC. So Unified Communications as a Service. Um, we have some extremely good and granular data on this. And what this tells us, uh, if you go and look at the lovely purple on the far right, is that for fewer than 500 seats, you're actually going to be cheaper in the cloud by a slight bit uh, than you would be on-premise. But for more than 500 seats, you are considerably better off on-premise doing it yourself than going to the cloud. Um, that's those last two columns, as you can, as you can see. Um, that's actually a very valid point, and something you should think about is over time, the, the total costs of software as, as a service are actually higher than doing it yourself. There are great benefits to doing software as a service, and I don't mean to denigrate it, nor do I mean to imply that you shouldn't do software as a service. You just need to be realistic about what you're promising the business. So the bottom line is, is cloud cheaper? Well, one of the things we did was take a, you know, create a general purpose um, index and say if you have your own data center, the chances are pretty darn good that you will get better rates doing it on your own data center than you will using either infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, or certainly software as a service. Um, you know, software as a service in particular and platform as a service are going to cost you up to 20% more. Yes, you heard it from Namurti. Now, that doesn't take into consideration any, any discounts you've negotiated, which can easily be, you know, that 20%. Um, it also doesn't mean that you should just throw in a line item, gee, it's going to be more expensive by 20% and leave it at that. Uh, we'll talk about, you know, some of the things you can be doing, but the key thing is you really don't want to walk in with this great promise of cost savings from cloud because that will lead to tears. Uh, unless you're clever with your negotiations, unless you've thought through your design and all its complexity, and, and unless you have a very good understanding of your current internal costs, you probably can't keep that promise. And even if you have and do, it may still be running you roughly the same cost as you are doing internally. So why would you do cloud in the first place? Well, the big one is agility. And what you really need to do is develop operational metrics around speed of deployment of applications and services. And that's actually key. Our clients were successful, have sold cloud internally, not based on it's saving me money, but based on I can meet your business needs faster and better, particularly, again, beyond the scope of this particular presentation, 
but particularly if you're doing DevOps, you can actually get something up and running on cloud within hours to minutes and let the line of business tweak and fine tune it, something that's more challenging to do internally, uh, although obviously if you're doing DevOps on an internal DC, there's nothing stopping you from that, but it just makes it simpler to just get it out there and easy to see and change. And also a lot of the tool sets tend to be more cloud optimized as time goes on. The second big reason is scalability and expandability, you know, the cloud burst model. Um, you're not seeing that a whole lot yet, or I should step back. I think what you're seeing a lot of right now is planned cloud bursting. So someone who has an extremely predictable workload burst knows that we're going to do the majority of what we're doing internally and then burst externally in a hybrid model. You know, retail companies and anyone that does a, a significant fraction of their business on a predictable uh, cycle in the year or week tends to use this. What you're going to see over time, though, is the ability to do unpredictable um, bursting as, you know, people put something up and see, oh, gee, this promotion drove a huge amount of traffic and we just burst, it, burst seamlessly to the cloud. I also mentioned the development ecosystem. Uh, increasingly, the sophisticated tool suites are getting developed first for cloud because the vendors aren't stupid. They get it. Cloud is the direction of the future, so they're going there first. Uh, one of the areas where we saw a um, really interesting shift over the past couple of years is in SDN, uh, software-defined networking, particularly those, you know, those big switches that you put into your data center. Um, what the vendors that make SDN switches are increasingly doing is trying to sell them to the cloud providers rather than, than optimizing them for enterprises because that's where they're getting used more. And that's going to be true across the board with application suites as well. Uh, quality, you know, sometimes IT will get access to better solutions than it can field. A big one is disaster recovery as a service. Uh, security as a service is another, is another key one. What tends to happen is the guys that specialize in disaster recovery or security as a service can do a better job than IT can, so why not let them do it? Um, last but not least, if you're doing cloud native work, it can be more economical from an application standpoint. So what does all this mean? When you're building your business case, you don't just want to look at the stuff, the dollars and cents that we showed you, although that should be an important piece of what your business case is. You should actually have these operational metrics and be prepared to show not only your current baseline, but the improvement over baseline as you begin to move to cloud. And you're probably saying, that's great, Shauna. You just said that everything you showed us is step one. What about steps two, three, four, and five? We've got that. That's something we walk our clients through. So stay tuned. We can certainly you know, share that with you. So wrapping everything up before we get to answering some questions, um, the first takeaway is don't necessarily expect to save money in cloud with re without re-architecting your solutions and doing a mix of IAS, PaaS, and to a certain extent SaaS. Uh, don't plan to lift and shift except for compelling reasons of resilience. Right now, this idea of you know, the floating workload is a great idea. We're not quite there yet. You can certainly, you know, those of you who are architects should plan for that and anticipate it and have a strategy for getting your disaster recovery seamlessly integrated into that point, you know, three to five years out when you're doing all of that. Uh, but don't assume you're doing it, you know, on, on June, in June 13th, 2017. Don't fail to model in-house versus cloud costs and operational metrics uh, based on what's actually going on. Now keep in mind, this is tricky because if you're going to re-architect an application, you don't really want uh, to model a re-architected application that's cloud-based versus your in-house, but do the best you can. Collect your data, data, do the tests. The more actual data, you, performance data you have, the better it is and the easier it is to understand what's going to happen. And do make sure you capture real metrics and assign value to things like resilience, performance, and agility consistently across all your platforms, whether it's in-house, IAS, PAS, and SaaS. And don't forget that there are people costs associated. Um, hopefully you believe me. If there's anyone sitting here going, you know, John, I don't believe you need all those people, the thing I will leave you with is that there's certainly a, quite a number of companies that have built out an offering that's front-ending the cloud. So these are professional services firms that you pay to manage your cloud services for. That's essentially a tacit acknowledgement that you do need human, human intervention to manage your cloud, and otherwise these companies wouldn't exist and wouldn't be ma making oodles of money like they are. So do plan to, to, to have these people and to pay for them, 
and the one that the two that tend to get most overlooked are the security specialists and procurement with a deep understanding of cloud. So with that, uh, I'll just move through quickly the last couple of slides, and then we'll go ahead and open it up to, quest to questions. Uh, for more information, if you're a client, you can contact Nemertes Client Services. They will get you a copy of the slides, put you in touch with myself or John Burke or anyone else who can answer those questions. So if you're a client, please just reach out to us and we'll get something scheduled. If you're not a client, uh, to answer the question, yes, this replay will be available in a day or two. We don't distribute the slides uh, to non-clients, but you're certainly welcome to contact sales and see about becoming a client. Next up, we have a webinar on Tuesday, July 11th, very soon. If you're not tired of me by now, you certainly will be by the end of the day, Tuesday, July 11th, because this one is going to be by me again on securing the Internet of Things, again, based on our cutting edge benchmark maturity model and study that looked at deployment across 625 organizations, 12 countries, et cetera, et cetera. Some very, very interesting things we found out about what successful IoT security deployments look like versus unsuccessful ones. So please come to that if you have any interest in IoT. Last but not least, next week we are holding our Nemertes Navigator 360 conference. Some of you are going to be there and we look forward to seeing you there. Uh, we're going to be talking about how to make digital transformation real. That's the journey from technology to business value. My business partner and uh, colleague Robin Garris has conducted a similarly groundbreaking study in DT. And we've been talking about some of the really interesting findings that we've been seeing about how technologists like yourselves and, you know, and vendors can work with organizations who are moving to digital, moving through their digital transformation journeys. Gosh, I hate that cliche, but it really is a journey. So what are some best practices and what are successful companies doing? So we'll be talking about that. And with that, I think I'll go ahead and open up to some questions and let's see what we've got. Uh, we've got a ton of great questions. Uh, let's see. Um, one question here, as cloud moves you from fixed to variable costing, do you, re do you recommend staffing to monitor ongoing billing and capacity management to assure you don't overpay? Um, well, uh, I also know who posted that, so uh, uh, you can go ahead and laugh at this response. Yes, I do recommend that. Please do monitor ongoing billing and capacity management, but the degree to which you can automate it, as you personally have done in some of your previous roles at previous companies, would be a really good thing. And that's actually something you really want to look into as you're moving from fixed to variable costing. So again, the question was, should you, should you have people who are keeping track of the billing, overseeing the billing, looking at the billing, and making recommendations based on the billing? Yes. And that's one of the reasons that um, procurement becomes very, very critical because it's not just procure and forget, it's an ongoing monitoring, you know, similar to what we used to do back in the day with tele telecom services, uh, but I think we can automate it better. Um, someone else asks a question, what size enterprise has that much staff? Six, 16 people for 1.8 million seems like a lot for small to medium companies. Is this for very large enterprises? Yes. Yes, and actually one of the things we did was pull out, you know, the large enterprises as we were doing some of this analysis. The challenge for those of you in SMEs or not-for-profits or in some cases government is you just don't have the ability to get that number of people, so you'll have to figure out ways to work around that. That is, a, that is for a larger enterprise. Um, wouldn't retraining existing IT staff, another question on staffing, and thank you for focusing on this, wouldn't retraining existing IT staff offset or reduce those staff costs? Yes and no. Um, obviously, that's not net new if you're retraining existing, and we actually recommend that you use existing, but it's still a cost. If you've got a guy who, or gal whose job it is now to, for example, using Jerry's example, monitor the, uh, you know, monitor the billing, uh, that person is very important. You need that person. He or she is now essential to your cloud initiative. And, um, you know, you can't do without them. So in a very real sense, they're part of your cost of cloud, even though it's not net new costs. So, yeah, how you present this is kind of up to you, but you don't want to set it up so that these people are not required. Um, you know, the... Uh, you know, there's a whole question, and I'm not sure when this question came in, but there's an entire operations issue with the cloud as well, 
who brings the tools, who the SMEs are to help resolve the severity, you know, se severity one things. Um, that is actually a great observation, and I know the person who, who asked this as well, and uh, it's, a, it's a very, very good observation, and in fact, we didn't get to the next level of looking at cloud ops, because right now, the cloud solution architects are picking up ops, but over time, that is going to be increasingly important. Um, you need a go-to person, a go-to party when something goes down. You don't want, you know, you don't want your architects carrying beepers and going, oh my gosh, we just, you know, uh, the U.S. West went, just went down and we've got to, you know, go do something. You actually want cloud ops folks. Um, what does a cloud architect do versus the solution architects or the platform engineers? Hopefully I answered that in going through this, but if I didn't, the cloud architect is actually looking at a lot of these bigger picture issues like how do I put in place disaster recovery across a range of, of providers? So how does our disaster recovery strategy mesh with, let's say, today we're going to go with Amazon and Google, tomorrow we're going to add Microsoft into the mix, how do we build out a DR as a service that ultimately is going to vanish when we can get to fully mobile, um, uh, fully mobile workloads? But looking at that whole portfolio, the cloud solution architects are looking at that very practical question of, okay, I've got to combine a bunch of VMs into a workload and look at the, ca the capacities of the workload and look at how they're getting bundled together. Um, it's a bit more granular, but every bit is important. So hopefully that answered that question. Um, any visibility or modeling of a hybrid concept of secured compute in the cloud while managed storage on present, on premise? That is an excellent question, and I would really like to say, yes, that's built into our model, call us. Actually, we don't have that built into the model, and it's a really interesting idea. Uh, we'd love to talk to you about why you want to see that, um, you know, what the use case is here, because it's certainly something we can do without great hardship. We have you know, we have hybrid and on-premise models that, as, again, we can link into this. So certainly something we can help you do. Um, we'd like to under, better understand why you want to do that uh, as part of assisting you with that. Okay, let me see. Uh, well, we're actually at 10 to the hour, so I think we're getting ready to wrap up, and I believe that would be my cue to hand back off to you, Rachel. Thanks, Jana. With that, we will wrap up today's webinar. Thank you very much for your time and attention today. Again, please join us for our next webinar on Tuesday, July 11th, Securing the Internet of Things, presented by John Till Johnson. A registration link will be posted to our website shortly. A replay of this webinar will be available soon for your viewing. If you would like to follow up with us and you are a client, please send an email to clientservices at numerities.com. If you're not a client, and and please send an email to research at or sales at Thank you very much, and this concludes our webinar.